And the only reason I know that is because the year before, the Knights Templar did not do it here or do it uh, did perform the service. They actually marched at the White House. So they didn't. They did it actually at the White House. Well, they actually didn't do a service at the White House. It was a marching and drill ceremony that occurred at the White House, it and then for the Easter observance. No, no, just in general, just as a visit okay. to the White House. But what happened was after the stock market crash, the local DC commander got so much flack that they decided, okay, let's not do a White House trip during a you know a big economic issue. And so they decided, let's do something that's a little bit more family friendly, more focused on sort of the principles and the values of the fraternity. And so they decided to create something called the Easter Sunrise Service Program. And they started it at the Washington, oh, sorry, you're good? Yeah, the, no, no, uh, we're fine. The, the Arlington Memorial Amphitheater. And so for the first 50 years, this event actually occurred at the amphitheater. And then in around the 1950s, I want to say 1954, 1956, it moved over, and they started uh, having these services here at the George Washington National Masonic Memorial. Now, for many years, it was held outdoors on the front steps that are That's absolutely right. majestic. That's right. And in fact, I thought we were going to do it today, but I, 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 the Grand Master... Uh, made a decision that we're going to be inside, and I think that's a good idea. Indeed. It's, it's a little cloudy, a little chilly out there. Yeah. Uh, with Easter being early the last couple of years, uh, that is earlier in the calendar year. That's right. It's still pretty chilly as that's right. uh, outside. So having the, you know, having all the Sir Knights in their uniforms is probably fine because these are, yes. the, these are not thin. No. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, for what, 50-plus years, 60 yeah. years, we've been all doing it outside. So there have been days where it's been raining and sleeting and, and miserable and miserable and you're, you're gonna ruin your hat you're gonna ruin your chapeau you're gonna ruin your so I can certainly understand so we we say a lot on the channel yes and it remains true the historic Knights Templar the crusading Knights of the 1300s right they are only philosophically connected That's right. to the fraternity That's right. they are not historically connected to the fraternity. Can you t talk a little bit about that? I know we've gotten into and I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. Well, no, no pun on Easter morning. <laughs> but uh, Nice. Very good. <laughs> but, you know, th we are not a part of the crusading knights. No, no. And I think, I think that there, are, there were brethren when they formed this organization that, uh, that really appreciated the values and the spirits of those individuals, and they wanted to create an organization based on that. Now, I will say... There have been historians like Albert Pike, for example, or researchers and, and Mason scholars like Albert Pike who have tried to identify connections, but they're very tenuous, and quite frankly, it's, they're not, it's not accurate. So, just And nevertheless, it, what's the, well, who cares? Well, because the organization is here. There's values and principles that we you know, are trying to inculcate and, and, and share. So to me, regardless if there's no connection to, to the original Knights, there's value in what we're doing today. Additionally, yes, we often talk about that Freemasonry is open to men of all faiths. That's right. However, Templarism, and even York Rite to some degree, does lean decidedly Christian. I mean, the Knights Templar, these yes. are the, you yes. know, the, I mean, they, they, there's, a, uh, there's a cross on stage. So That's right. So we're, we're not uh, saying anything incorrect to say that this is a Christian part of of the fraternity that that's right and also it's you are not forced to join the organization you know if, if you're if you're attending a, a commander or visiting a commandery and you're not a knights templar you know we we hope that that group is telling you you know this is an optional thing this is not something that's required you don't lose anything from not joining it but if you are a christian or you know i think the term is give preference to the christian religion if that's important to you if your faith is important to you if religion is, I mean, certainly we're Easter sunrise sure. services. If that is important to you, consider joining it because I think you'll find that it's your fraternal experience married with your, you know, uh, religious uh, observances. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you are Orthodox, so your I'm Easter's Greek not for another week. That's or so. right. So I'm I'm just here for fun. So, you right, know, so I've got nothing to do today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I'm just. So joking. your family's not hanging out anywhere to get. My family yeah. is was not expecting me to be at church today. Okay. So I appreciate it as a Greek Orthodox, but you know, right, that, right. Tell, ask me in a couple more weeks. So just discussing, again, we've probably got folks watching who, who are yes. unfamiliar with us, the military-style uniforms with the white plumes. That's right. That's generally everybody in the United States. 
but they're brothers much like our Scottish right caps. That's right. Um, and there's a few purple mixed in. That's right. Explain different jurisdictions. That's that's a different uniform. Though that is an acceptable, agreed upon uniform that you are allowed to wear. Most knights like that sort of black the dark uniform. In fact, I, I saw a couple brothers who were wearing the old traditional frock, which was this sort of long jacket, and that was the you riding were wearing jacket. One. You were wearing that. I wish. No, no, that was the. Well, you I had was, a cape. Yeah, that on was the, or something. That was the cape in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I like a good cape, but there was a brother who, <laughs> who uh, had a full-on frock, an old riding frock, which is really cool. So I'm trying to get a photograph with him later. Now, historically speaking, um, we are not the first to broadcast this. We're perhaps the first to stream it last year, yes. and then again in 2024 here. Yes. But it was streamed, streamed. It was broadcast. broadcast that's on right. The radio on the radio. That's right. There were there in the was, early days. That's right. There were certain years where they pitched couple dollars in to get a radio broadcast program and so this was broadcast out on Easter morning for several years and I think that helped talk about the fraternity mention you know the fraternity's values and principles which is a good idea well to all the knights and masons watching if you would please share this and uh, give us a shout out on the comments there yeah um, we'll, we'll respond to them a little bit later on and uh, we will we'll get those uh, answered but uh, tell us where you're watching from where yeah. your commandery is or your Scottish Rite Valley or your Blue Lodge what have you um, what else should we know about this I mean we've got brothers literally from coast to coast here. that's right so, that's right so who are who's the California Hawaii New York Massachusetts Texas it runs the gamut um, and th by the way this is a non-denominational service so it's not like this is a specific, or something that, like absolutely that. right. You know, as much as I'd love to hear a little orthodox thrown in, this is non-denominational. So I think it should be intended for, well, for everybody. Well, orthodox, everybody would have to stand, wouldn't they? Well, there's a lot of other s incense. You know, there's a lot of yeah. stuff going on in an orthodox church. Now, again, we, we do see um, the cap, the, the brethren who are wearing sort of more of a, a police style or officer style that's cap. right that's right uh, is that, that also is, that is part of the uniform nope that's part of the uniform there are you know officers those that yes. wear that. especially as you go up the uh, uh grand, grand commander in line you may see those but again that's just part of the optional uniform i i like it because it allows so here's the thing every jurisdiction has different things so you'll notice I'm wearing a very clean, not necessarily lots of stuff on me. Sure. Sometimes you'll have a cap on rather than a hat. Um, some will have cordons, you know, yellow, green. You'll also see certain officers have something uh, sort of a cordon that there's, they actually hang over their, their necks. They might be different color, like purple. Those are executive officers, like uh, yeah, department see, commanders. What, on Chris's uniform here, what you can see is DC for DC Commandery, number three, his name. And then uh, explain these two badges, if you can. Sure. So I think this one is the Knight of Malta, and then this is the Red Cross. And so these are the orders that you go through. So Those are a little more ornate than they wear in Maryland. In, well, these are DC ones. Yeah, 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 Ma yeah, Maryland is, is a little more, it's just sort that's of right. just a white and red cross. Yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah. No. Well, it depends on the commandery. Some commanderies have their own. Some you can purchase online. We do custom ones, which is sort of nice. And then I really like the uniform for two reasons. Number one, you always get to know where you're from, right? Because if you're in D.C. or New Jersey, I can tell, oh, you're from right. New Jersey. You're from South Carolina. They, they do the two-letter initials for your jurisdiction. And then the also is your name tag. So you can never, ever forget a brother's name. You just look at the name tag. No. And I think it might have been Brent Morris who told me, and I'm, I'm invoking Brent's name, um, Brother Brent, good morning. If he's Brent watching. is in California right so he's, now. So, so Brent, he's I know he's not watching. Absolutely not watching. No, he's yet. not. Um, however, at least I not believe live. it was Brent who told me that the militaristic style of the uniform is sort of left over after the Civil War. All these uniform makers that had yes. popped up. Yes. Um, I about, think we're starting soon. Uh, well, about 10, 12 minutes or so. Um, uniform makers had surpluses after the Civil War, and That's they decided right. to start pushing them to fraternities to wear. And not just the Masons. No, You're talking about of other Pythias. That's right, not some fraternities. Yeah, there was a surplus in uniforms, so it made the uniform cheaper. It made it easier for Masons to do it. Before that, Masons, or at least Knights Templar, used to wear sashes, or they, well, some still do, but they had to sort of have a traditional sash and an apron. And for a while, they that wasn't really part of the dress, but we're starting to see the apron because there's a couple, there's some um, amendments that were passed through uh, the Grand Encampment that are bringing the aprons back. So we're going to see even more alterations or differentiations in the style. Now, you mentioned a minute ago about the structure. Going on before Christ the Christian soul 
sign of triumph, Satan's horse doth flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Christians, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Christians, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the of Jesus going on before. Crowns and thorns may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, and that cannot fail. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with us your voices in the triumph song. ages we with angels sing onward Christian soldiers marching us to war with the cross streaming and the rockets red with the bombs bursting Mark Wright, who led us in the national anthem. The first hymn was Onward Christian Soldiers, and now we are getting commentary 
are welcome by Sir Knight David Custer. Sir Knights, ladies and guests, you may be seated. Who, David Custer may be most eminent Grand Master of the Grand Academy of the United States. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Sir Knights, ladies and guests, and especially my dear sisters of the social order of the most known, you honor us by once again coming to the nation's capital to celebrate with us the grand encampment of Knights Templar and our many members, whithersoever dispersed around this great country of ours, for the 94th year in this nation's capital to celebrate historically what is probably the most important event in the life of a Christian, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I am honored to, for a season, be your selected leader during this time. Easter has always been an important part of my life since my birth, since I was born on Easter Sunday morning. It has a passion for me that is hard to put into words. My oldest daughter also was born on Easter Sunday, so I think I was twice blessed. But whether you were born on Christmas, I'm sorry, on Easter or not, the fact that we are here and we know the reason why we're here makes it doubly important that we celebrate at this time for the right reason. The Knights Templars of old, as well as the Knights Templars of today, have been charged to be defenders of the faith, the true faith, the holy faith that sets us and separates us from others, and we are truly blessed. I would also like to thank our host, the George Washington National Masonic Memorial, and I would like to recognize our dear friend, Sir Knight Timothy B. Strong, who will bring us greetings on behalf of our host body, and will bid you uh, a good morning. Sir Knight Tim. Sir Knight Tim is Thank you, Grand Master. representative for the George Washington National Masonic Memorial. Good morning and happy Easter. Good morning. My name is Tim Strawn. I'm the director of development here at the memorial. But today I also stand before you as the eminent commander of Mount Vernon Commandery No. 1 in Columbus, Ohio, the first commandery established after the formation of the Grand Encampment. On this occasion, it's so appropriate that we meet here and have for so many years in this memorial to the preeminent champion of religious freedom that he and those other revolutionists sought to establish in this land. What a wonderful, wonderful place to be. What a tribute to him. As we go forward from here today after hearing the wonderful message that we will and we reflect on what Templary means to us, let us, with faith and humility, go forward and let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Most excellent Grand Master. Let us
Thank you, Sir Knight. Mark, you may be seated, and Sir Knight, uh, at your will and pleasure, you may uncover and uh, be a little bit more comfortable while we hear the <coughs> pastoral message. Next will be an invocation by the Reverend Sir Knight Terry. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time as we move through every sorrow and trial of this life. Uphold us with knowledge of the final morning when in the good and glorious presence of your risen Son, we shall share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever free to be your people. Amen. Amen. Sir Knight Perman will be right in a minute. Graham Prelate will be going in front. Next is the first lesson by Sir Knight Paul D. Erickson, Reverend Sir Knight Paul D. Erickson. The first lesson, Acts 10, 34 through 43. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God chose no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. For the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. The Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciples, disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That was the Reverend Sir Knight Robert J. Nightmare, Royal Mineral Associate Graham Prelate. The second lesson, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 26. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Would you please stand?
If you are covered, Sir Knight, please uncover. Be covered and be seated. Good morning. morning. Bill Riggs reminded me that I forgot to wear a watch this morning. (laughs) Oh, hey. So if anyone has a calendar, if you would let me know when it's Tuesday, we'll, uh, we'll try to wrap up. Be Thou My Vision. They, uh, they put that song in there for me. Whatever may befall, part of my own heart. We sing a song in church. Maybe you sing it in yours, Thy Will Be Done. Are we brave enough to believe that? Or does it just feel good saying that? I have a little bit of a different Christmas, of Christmas, Grandmaster. Sorry, sir. (laughs) I've said Christmas and maybe my wife is at home watching this, so maybe that means I'm gonna get a puppy. (laughs) I've not been successful in six or seven years on that, but hope springs eternal, right? Christmas, my family was surrounded by an unexpected death. My mom, who turned, would have turned 83 last Wednesday, was in the kitchen preparing Easter supper. Good gravy alive, man. What holiday are we at? Is it Thanksgiving? (laughs) Hanukkah, maybe. She was in the kitchen on Christmas Eve preparing dinner for everyone and her health wasn't the best anyway but that's what moms do right my dad stepped into the garage to bring some more chairs into their kitchen and he came back and my mom was in the floor she had broken her hip they got her to the hospital they couldn't get her up because she was in so much pain but the the paramedics could she had surgery on Christmas Day the doctors were very optimistic God had other plans. We were praying for healing in my mom's life. And I stand before you this morning to tell you that God, in fact, did heal my mom. But he gave her an eternal healing. About 10 a.m. on December the 26th, those of you who are ministers have stood at the bedsides of countless families when their loved ones said goodbye. But with my mom, I never saw it. I never realized that Those last few breaths she was taking so quickly were her final ones, but they were. So I've spent this year reflecting on that. It occurs to me that for so much of life, and most of you in this room will understand it, I've looked around this morning and see quite a few young people here. For so much of life, young folks, Life gives and gives and gives and gives. And then one day the clock slowly turns, amen? And life slowly starts to take away. And it begins to take away things that are greatly cherished by us. My mom, my grandparents, a little dog that I had for 16 years slowly takes away, but how do we escape the gloom and, and the despair that so easily creeps into our heart? We almost, we almost embrace it, you know? I find myself doing that where we, hey, leave me alone. I want to have a pity party, but we are not called to do that. doesn't mean the struggle is not real. The struggle, in fact, is very real. And when I try to persevere through the challenges and difficulties of life and my own power, you know what I do? Do I succeed or fail? I fail. So do you. Not only do I fail, but I make everyone around me miserable. So do you. And we're really, through our doubt and not willing to be let go of things and turn them over to God, it's we're really saying that, Father, our, our faith is not strong enough to turn this over to you, to be discouraged and to feel hopeless. In fact, the last few years in ministry, many have suggested and 
shared that how they're struggling with loneliness and anxiety and, and fear in their personal lives. And right now, it's, it's easy to say that the future uh, does seem bleak. Our economy is on a roller coaster ride with huge swings in the market. Washington is as divided today as it has ever been in the history of our nation. The normalcy of our lives has been for a few years now, perhaps forever changed. In many respects, we do live in a world full of uncertainties, which make it easy to be overwhelmed by our circumstances. I would submit to you that this is a spiritual battle. We see it through physical eyes, but it's really a spiritual battle. I want to share how our emotional and physical and spiritual struggles can be turned into a victory, a victory which will bring you unimaginable peace. You know, I'm going to let Rob and Paul check me on this, but I believe the word peace is used in the Holy Bible over 400 times, described in two separate ways. One is the peace with God, and secondly, there is the peace of God. Believers get both of those. Non-believers do not. The peace with God. When we try to live our lives apart from God and Jesus Christ, we never truly achieve peace in our lives. In fact, the Bible says in Romans, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate this morning. What this means is that when we are called and we obediently obey that call and we come to God through Jesus Christ, all enmity between man, me, and you, and God is gone. James tells us in 4.4, it's not about good works. Paul said there are none righteous. How many? No, not one. James tells us, do you not know that friendship with the world is what? enmity with God. You can't serve two masters. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It's a choice. That's what scripture says. There's the peace of God and then there's the peace with God. The only way you can have that is to be in a true, deep, full meaning, obedient relationship through Jesus Christ. Remember, or you may remember the movie, uh, Indiana Jones in the last crusade and they went into the final chamber and there sat the Holy Grail and this old knight who the movie suggests had lived for hundreds and hundreds of years and there's all these goblets laid out on the table before them and he says to what? Choose wisely. One cup contained life. The other cups, beautiful as they were, bejeweled, gold-plated, contain death. So I would submit that the path to God cannot be obtained by any source other than the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection on Sunday morning. When we have this peace with God, it becomes the foundation and backdrop of every aspect of our life. When we have peace with God. The book of Psalms tells us it becomes real in our lives. The Lord will give strength unto his people and the Lord will bless his people with peace. And I stand before you this morning to testify that that peace is real, that that peace can, can, can permeate every ounce and fiber of your body as it has mine. I did not want to lose my mom. I'm in the flesh and I'm selfish. Those of you that have lost your mom did not want to lose her or your dad. But brothers and sisters, oh, brothers, don't we rejoice knowing where they are? Don't we rejoice knowing that the hand of our Savior, though scarred from the torment, the most evil, wicked thing man has ever done to put the Son of God on a cross, that same hand that was injured in hatred? We're not promised tomorrow, are we? Tend to today, and should tomorrow arrive, then brothers and sisters, you rest assured in the fact that God is already there. Jesus is already in all of our tomorrows. He's already there. There's nothing that's going to befall you or me.
that the tender hand of Christ will not sustain us. The book of Philippians says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just, okay, God, this is yours. I'm going to go on. It requires us to be intentional in our walk with Christ, brothers and sisters. It means that we intentionally turn towards Christ. We do like the faithful disciple that Jesus most loved and his mother. We cling to the foot of the cross when others flee. We let the testimony of our lives resonate in the world that surrounds us. Who would have ever thought that religious persecution would come to our country and that God's church and God's believers would be under as much criticism and attack as we are today? Cling, cling to the cross. As I said, we play a role in obtaining the peace Jesus talks about. We choose that we will walk faithfully towards and in the midst of our circumstances. We walk towards them rather than being overwhelmed by the whirlwind they create in our lives. Friday evening, Brother Paul talked about how that Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He crossed the stream and he went into there. The, the, the olive trees that are in the garden today are the same ones, many that were there when Jesus knelt and prayed. Jesus didn't want to drink the cup. In fact, he asked his father if it was his will that the cup might pass from him. Then he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thou will be done. The cup of bitterness that our Lord drank. A lot of pastors will tell you that that was the cross that he drank. He did. But what was in that cup that the Lord drank was full of my sin. It was full of your sin. That's what the Lord drank and took upon himself that you and I might be called redeemed. He paid the sacrifice for you and I. From the cross he cried tetelestia, which means it's, it's an accounting term that the slate has been wiped clean. The debt has been paid in full. So you and I walk towards the cross. We cling to the cross regardless of the whirlwind in our lives. Daniel, because of the peace of God, slept an entire night in the lion's den. Joseph, because of the peace of God, rose to be a mighty ruler after having been sold into slavery. Remember the stormy night on the ocean? The Bible describes it as a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat and that it was nearly consumed by the water. Yet what did Jesus do? He was sleeping. He was sleeping, not disturbed by the storm. His disciples woke him out of fear of dying. Remember, they had seen him do all these things. They heard him declare who he was, but they were afraid of dying. Lord, don't you hear the waves? Don't you hear the wind? Why are you sleeping? But he was. They didn't know what to do. They were overwhelmed by their circumstances. And they did call upon Jesus. And what I would speak into your lives this morning is what Jesus spake into the storm. Three words. Peace, be still. Then ask his followers. He asked his followers, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? When we leave this place today, I want each of you to go home next week and reflect on the times of great fear that you've had in your lives, the times of anxiety shared with me as we were standing at the grave of a dear friend. And he reminded me that healing is eternal. And it's in the midst of our struggles that we find out how strong our God is. So how do you obtain this victory, this, this consistent uh, walk of faith in spite of the difficulties in life? I would ask you this, how is your prayer life? How are you praying? 
Philippians tells us, and it should say Terry, but it doesn't, but it should. Terry, you do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Do you think we surprise God with our requests? Do you think he goes, oh my, Robin, I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh no, oh no. God's already in our tomorrows. God's in this moment. God is in this afternoon. Nothing's a surprise to him. Sadly, you know what might be a surprise? Are you ready? I, I should have wore steel toed shoes because it's going to hurt my toes. Maybe what surprises God is when we actually come to him and we surrender to him the burdens of our heart. Do you know that God longs for you? Do you understand that? That God chases after you? If only one of you in here, Jesus would have still came and died on the cross for just one. Just one. But thank God there's so many of us that he did. We try to pull God down into the midst of this ugly, ugly world. But through our prayer life, we're trying to lift ourselves and this world up into his eternal presence so that we can have this victory that scripture tells us about. The word anxious, you all check me on this, but what I find is that it means to be pulled in two different directions. When we worry, we feed this feeling of anxiety. Did you hear me? When we worry, we feed this feeling of anxiety. And my prayer for you is that you let God be God in your life and that you see his mighty and wondrous love. What is it? There was a saying the last year or so. It said, let go and what? Oh my goodness, say that a little bit louder, would you? Let go and let God. It's easy to say, right? But do it. Never forsake a steady and consistent prayer life. Prayer will absolute, absolutely. And listen, just because we're ministers, there's a whole row of us up here that are ministers. Do we get it right every time, Paul? No. Not even one out of ten times do we get it right. We struggle just like you guys. We're just given a different set of responsibilities as ministers. We all need to work on our prayer life. Prayer is not difficult. If you go to the high church, you hear very, very elaborate prayers and ancient liturgies that have been passed down for generations. If you come to my little Baptist church, you, you might hear one of the little farmers pray, and it's just as sweet. All we have to do is talk to God, just like you would talk to me. It doesn't have to be fearfully approached. Do remember when you're on your knees, we should all have knees that are worn out, right? Remember you're kneeling on holy ground. Tell God what's on your heart. And not only tell him what's on your heart, but you mark well that you thank him for the blessings you have in the midst of all our difficulties and trials. In the midst of Jesus being in the tomb, his disciples ran and hid in fear rather than praising and thanking God for what had just happened. They should have been rejoicing. And listen, you and I would have been hit as well. We would have been hit as well. So 2,000 years later, it's easy to cast stones and judge them. And do you let your mind wander? Try to take it and focus it on God. The Bible tells us to take every... We have to prompt Baptist. Who dwells inside of your heart? The Holy Spirit, Christ, dwells in us, right? So you bear in mind where your feet go. You take Jesus. What your ears hear, you're taking Jesus. Where you cast your eyes and take into your heart, you're causing the eyes of Christ to look. He deserves better. He deserves better. Keep the garbage out. Take the trash out. We must not allow these things into our lives. Guard your heart 
with your eyes and your ears. Choose carefully what will enter your life. It's important to work always towards our faults, resting in God. And you can't just think about what is good. You also have to walk beside and with other believers. It's, it's a joint. Those of you that grew up on a farm, one mule does a pretty good job. But if you had two mules, you could plow a much greater field. Find the believer that you can walk with and, and serve with and pray with and share the peace of God with. Finally, I would say this. I call you to live in the present. We all have a past. Jesus says it's been wiped clean. Live in the future. Live in the day. Don't let the fears of the future overwhelm you. Do not be afraid. God has been, is, and forever will be on his throne. We pray for the coming of his day that you and I might stand in his eternal presence and with the angels of heaven sing mighty praises unto him. In closing on my message, I just want to say one thing about prayer. This building, many of you probably have been to the top of it, and you can cast your gaze across the capital of our great nation, and it is a great nation. We've just all managed to become disagreeable at times, but it's still a great nation. You can see, if you go up to the Washington Monument, you can see for miles, if you go to New York or Chicago into their great buildings, you can see for miles. As you take off on a jet coming here, you can see for miles. But you mark well and remember this. No man ever saw so much as when he knelt on his knee. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Sir Knight's recover. You may be seated. We're, we're going to go into another uh, responsatory prayer. Living together as the faithful people of the resurrection, let us pray for the whole people of God, each in accordance with their needs, and responding, hear our prayer. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Passover Lamb, has taken away the sin of the world. Forgive us and all people, Lord, in your mercy. Your son said, peace be with you. Bring your peace to the world and to our own country. Lord, in your mercy. Your son appeared to Mary Magdalene when she was weeping. Comfort those who are sad, lonely, or grieving. Lord, in your mercy. Your son met the woman and asked them to tell the disciples about his resurrection. Guide Christians everywhere to witness to the resurrection and their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Your son proclaimed himself to the two disciples from the scriptures and made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. Reveal him to us and all people through the teaching of your word and the celebration of your holy meal. Lord, in your mercy. Your son strengthened the face of Thomas by telling him to touch his hands and side. Reassure those who are troubled by doubts and strengthen their faith in your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Your son conquered death by his death and won victory by his resurrection. Be with those who are dying and lead them to life with you forever, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, grant that all who now celebrate these joyful holy days here on earth may finally praise you forever with all the angels and saints in heaven 
We ask this through your risen Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If you'll please turn the page in your program, we'll have the music for the Lord's Prayer. If you would please join me in singing. Nights re cover. Well, I have prayer that I need from our Grand Master, Sir Knight David Lee Kuzmi, North Seminary Grand Master of the Grand Canal. Sir Knights, ladies and guests, on behalf of the officers and staff of the Grand Encampment of Knights Templar, our profound thanks for your love and support in attending this service this morning. To my dear friends who are standing behind me, the national leaders of most of the Masonic orders across this beautiful country of ours who took time out of their busy schedules to be with us, our profound thanks. To our video team, our musical team, our prelates, and our religious activities and uh, Easter Sunrise Service Committees, a job well done. We now separate and go again in, to mix with the world. My prayer is for each and every one of you to share the love of Christ, to be the banner, the beacon, that voice that someone needs to hear. As true defenders of God's faith, it is our challenge. May God bless and each and every one of you and your families this most holy of days. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, go forth in this place rejoicing and proclaiming the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. His tomb is empty, and he is risen. He is risen indeed. Brethren, worthy is the Lamb that was slain and has redeemed us to God by his blood to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep you. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.